live from the Sands Convention Center, Las Vegas, Nevada. Extracting the signal from the noise, it's The Cube, covering HP Discover 2015. Brought to you by HP. And now your host, Dave Vellante. Welcome back to HP Discover 2015, everybody. This is The Cube, we go out to the events, we extract the signal from the noise. Check out hpdiscover.social, it's our new digital experience that we've overlaid on top of the cube for HP Discover. It's got all kinds of cool social feeds and videos and other content. Vish Malshand is here, he's a good friend of the cube. Uh, he's director of product marketing at HP within the storage group. And Bruce Trevarthan is here, he's the group CEO of the cloud, uh, public cloud service provider. Gentlemen, welcome to the cube. Thank you. Both Thank of you have been on Thank the cube you. before. We have. And, uh, yeah. So why don't we start though, Bruce, with your company. Uh, tell us a little bit about you so guys. the cloud is a uh, public cloud service Great provider. name. Yeah, the cloud, <laughs> well, that was in 2008, early 2008, so we sort of got on the bandwagon nice and early yeah. and uh, managed to secure the, the name. It's become a little generic, obviously, uh, but it's, it's a great term to hang our hat on. So the cloud's a public service provider in New Zealand, uh, more recently starting to roll into Canada, uh, with the intent of obviously providing infrastructure as a service uh, type um, uh, commodity services to the small business market in New Zealand, and again, that's pretty similar in other countries. Uh, on demand and with you know, zero touch, so automation is key. Great, and we'll get into that, and I really want to understand how you're using all flash, what your thoughts are. We were just having a discussion with, with Craig and Bruce from Alcoa, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Craig and Mike from Alcoa on uh, the all flash data center. Love to get your thoughts on that. But Fish, let me come to you. So, we've been tracking this flash journey that you guys have been on, it's been quite amazing. Yes, um, indeed. I want to make an observation right up front. Though. This, I've said that, I tweeted this out. This is an example, what you have done with Flash is a really good example of organic development inside of HP. And I, I said it's really the first blockbuster example since EVA. And it really is, it's organic development. You guys, you guys said we're going to do this on three par, we're not going to go buy yes. an array company that's going to give us an advantage of the stack. So you've done that, it's clearly been successful, but there's been a lot that's changed since we last met. We were in uh, Barcelona. Yes. Uh, we had Lee Pedlow on. So yeah, what's Lee. been new since we met last early in December? Sure, so, so Dave, I think um, the initial deployers of All Flash have uh, had, all had very good experiences. They've uh, been able to get predictable performance. They've been able to lower costs in many different dimensions. And feedback has been very positive. And what I'm hearing now is they want to do more. They want to do more applications on Flash. They want to do more things on Flash, right? And so, you know, it's interesting um, how close are we to that all Flash data center tipping point? I know, I know there's been some in the community that have talked about this. Uh, it's clearly on the leading edge, right? But you know, I don't, I don't think it's that far away if people start to move more and more applications and uh, start thinking about sort of how they deploy the Flash. David Flores says we're a year and a half away. <laughs> from the tipping point. Yeah, from you know. From an economic standpoint, which is, he's the only guy saying that, but right. but I like it. I like the conversation. It's a good conversation starter. What do you think, Bruce? As far as tipping point's concerned, I, I'm probably more inclined to think that it's, it's going to be a transition. Uh, you know, we're using all flash uh, arrays now, three HP 3 par uh, all flash arrays, and you know, the key element there is performance, but you're always going to have data that, that is not, not being used, is not in flight, is not really accessed on a, regular basis, so to put that on SSD seems a little uh, overkill, uh, But and, and right now, today, the price point is not there to compete with Nearline. If it's cheaper. So if it's cheaper, would, then why not? You would Absolutely. put it there. If you, would. Right. you would, so unless, it's going to be more of a transition unless, around uh, pricing. Unless tape actually transforms again, right? I keep saying flape. Yeah. Well, flape is an uh, interesting idea, too. We'll uh, <laughs> it, needs some, it needs some development. Yeah, but, uh, yeah. Okay. But I mean, you know, Dave, the, the way I think about the all-flash data center is, okay, Let's let's tape is not dead, disk is not dead, I don't think it'll be dead. The question becomes, where's the center of deployment? Where's the center of innovation? Where's the lion's share of spend? In and, and that's what I think and, the old And flash, there's no question. Yeah, right. Where that 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 the market's rotating very rapidly. And, and I think let's let's now talk about, you know, if we look at some analogies, right? Um, Uber, Airbnb. Twitter, okay? Those platforms all grew on the fact that the internet was ubiquitous, right? Ubiquitous on phones, ubiquitous at home, 
ubiquitous on the PC. So here's the question. If Flash becomes somewhat ubiquitous in the data center, then what does that baseline infrastructure enable as capability, right? What use cases, right? One that I know Dave Floyer talked about, which I thought is getting a lot of interesting play here at Discover, is this use case of baking copies, the data. Data sharing, yeah. Yeah, and then you know, keeping the same copy on the same, oh, sorry, keeping the copy in the same array and using snapshots and using a fraction of the capacity, right? And so that dollop of 50 gig flash that you buy today, if you can make six copies and share it on the same device, are you down to cents per gig now? And then to your point, Bruce, I mean, you know, if you look at that cost equation, does that become lower than Nearline? Well, it does. That becomes very compelling, right? Now, we touched on tape before. Tape's always going to have a place. You, you look at that going out to LTO 10, you, you're not going to compete with tape <laughs> for a long term. From a story. cost standpoint, you, you no, just can't. no way. So, but, but look, if you can get flash down to that kind of price point, then that, that'll kill Nearline as well, and then we're done, right? Then so there's no uh, spinning disk. And of course, disk is not a, uh, it's a moving target, yeah. but flash prices are coming down faster than spinning disk. Yeah. So we think it's just a matter of time. But it's just a matter of time. So how are you using Flash in your data centers? So our transition to all Flash uh, last year, sort of end of end of uh, last year, was really around performance. Now, as Vish just mentioned, uh, if you've got the performance available, then you can. It opens the door to do a whole bunch of things that you never really thought of. If you need six copies of something, and you typically keep them on different SANs because of the performance impact, well, now you can keep them on one SAN because the performance impact is is not there. It's not it's not a concern. Uh, and because they're on one SAN, you can leverage things like dejube, snapshotting, all sorts of technologies uh, that you couldn't if they were separated physically. Um, for us, around the performance reason for going all flash, and you know, we're seeing a lot of customers placing uh, bigger and bigger demands on us as a service provider that we could not actually uh, accommodate under a spinning disk. Um, we had a combination of spinning disk and, uh, and some SSD historically, using that to augment the spinning disk and uh, adaptive optimization sort of uh, a concept. And uh, we still could not meet the demands of the heavy spikes that we were seeing from some users, particularly some of our users in the big data space. You know, they're ingesting huge amounts of data very quickly and then doing nothing for a few days, possibly. Um, and so to cope with that, it, it takes me back to the pre-virtualization space where you're having to build out for something you do once a week. Why do that, right? So with, with all flash, we can now accommodate these massive spikes and, and deliver on promise, right? So we can make big promises and to back them up with an all flash environment and deliver on that promise. So what about, I'm, I'm curious as to whether or not you're able to monetize that infrastructure from a quality of service standpoint. Um, are you able to, to deliver a guaranteed level of quality of service to users and charge them for that, for we example? We absolutely can. So I know another technology that's not brand new, but another great technology of HP 3 Power is performance optimization. Uh, and obviously with the QoS elements in there, we can guarantee IOPS per customer and deliver that out and, and, and guarantee that they will get the, uh, the the performance that they expect when they, when they need it. Are, are we at the point where you can provision capacity, provision IOPS, maybe even bandwidth programmatically? Yeah, so, so so exactly, Dave. I think going back to that uh, copy use case, so let's say you have production and you have test dev, and let's say you had some analytics run. Let's just say three copies, right? And traditional wisdom is to keep them separate. But let's say you put them on one array now, and you put guardrails, right? You said, okay, test dev gets 30%, no more. Analytics gets 20%, production gets 50%. Now, maybe production is running at 30%, you give it a 20% room to spike, mm. and now, you have the protection that none of these other workloads can overrun production, right? So it's a combination of all flash, scalable performance, and then priority optimization software to give you those rails, right? And comforts. And then if you want to do that programmatically, uh, you know, we actually announce uh, priority optimization controls within OpenStack. Right. Right, and so you can actually program it through OpenStack or, or REST API that we have available on the array as well. Are you using OpenStack or? We have installed OpenStack in our lab environment. We're definitely mm -hmm. staying close to it. Uh, we don't have it in production yet. What do you What do you have in production? So uh, our environment, I'm glad you asked. <laughs> our environment actually, with Vishnu and I were talking about this earlier, our environment from a smarts point of view, from a zero touch customer interface point of view is completely homegrown, completely custom built. And we just launched our third version of that, uh, which we've been refining over the last eight years, uh, which, which provides customers the ability to you know, deploy service on, uh, on uh, any of our locations in four minutes or less, 
uh, themselves at any time of day. And uh, we've recently just included the support for uh, multi-tiering or split-tiering per VM, which is a key thing that the uh, all-flash arrays allow us to achieve because now we can cut up the performance tiers and sell them at a different price point. Right. And the uh, best use case I can think of right now is a customer with a SQL server. They might want to pay sort of middle of the road disk type prices for their OS volume. They want the highest possible performance for their log volume. And then whatever they can afford for the scale out uh, requirements of their data volume. So that's three different tiers of disk in one VM. Rather than trying to stick it all on SSD and pay you know, for, pay to put your, your data at rest on SSD and whatever. So you're so getting granularity yeah. out of the, the infrastructure and you're able to monetize that. We can. The more granular can get the better. Can, can you set floors and ceilings for your quality of service or is it? Uh, you have to talk to the operations guys yeah, about okay. the actual uh, technical so, detail on how that's done, but I think it's pretty smart tech. Well, yeah. Let me ask you a question there, Dave, if you don't mind about Bruce. So, I mean, you know, so you said you have tiers, some flash, some spinning. Mm. So are these on separate arrays or? So historically we were uh, dealing with the, the whole uh, multiple uh, offerings of storage out of our environments by augmenting Nearline and SAS for the low end and augmenting SAS and SSD for the upper ends using adaptive optimization. But there was still a limit to that because we're dealing with spinning disk. The introduction of uh, all flash has meant that we now use the priority optimization, performance optimization technologies to uh, actually govern the IOPS, knowing full well that we have an abundance of them. And so we don't, we're no longer limited by the actual physical uh, capabilities of a disk. When did you first install all flash array? The all flash array uh, was installed in October 2014. Yeah, end 20, of last year. 2014, so prior to 2014, 100% of your primary storage spend was on either spinning or maybe hybrid. It was hybrid, storage, yeah, right? so we're running uh, uh, three powers with a mixture of Nearline, SAS, and SSD. Okay, so 0% at that time was all, all flash. flash. Correct. What would you say, look, look out 24 months from now, what percent of your spend do you think will be all flash versus sort of hybrid? It's pretty easy to answer that because we have a very prescriptive build and so we know exactly what our stack looks like. Uh, so from a ratio point of view, we would be spending uh, three quarters of our storage budget on flash and 25% on airline. So we will no longer buy spinning disk at the middle SAS tier. So three quarters of your spend by 2017 will be flash. all flash. Yeah. Uh, IDC numbers say, and I saw this at a recent conference, that 17% of the revenue for the entire storage market will be all flash. And that struck me as conservative. Yeah. Um, what yeah. do you guys, how do you guys see the market? I mean, yeah. you know, the other guys do the forecast, I know, but yeah, I know, yeah. and every forecast is wrong. I, we, it's always hard to forecast that. things like this, right? I think, from my observation, Dave, I think the, the forecasts have been a little conservative. I think it's, it's gone beyond everybody's wildest expectations. It's exceeded everybody's expectations, right? They, were, they had a pretty aggressive forecast, but it's even exceeded that now. Right, so that's really a big groundswell and a lot of momentum building on itself. Has the, has the uptick surprised you? Uh, you know, it has. Yeah. It has. It absolutely has uh, in terms of how aggressive it's been and how it's sort of feeding upon itself, right? These things, in our experience, go on an S-curve, OGIF OGI curve, and when you get the yeah. steep part of the S-curve, you yeah. you know, the... Inside the, the tornado. <laughs> yeah, the return <laughs> is so much greater than the effort, and then boom, it's it just takes off. and. A lot of times the market, I've done a lot, so I'm, you know, I'm, I've committed this crime, is you get these straight line forecasts. Yes. You know, things die like this, oh, right, and they right. go like that, and it's hard to predict sometimes, but it, but we think that we are on the cusp of that real yeah. steep part of the S-curve, and I think, Bruce, you're, you're seeing that too. We are, absolutely. I think one thing that's going to play into when this is actually going to hit this tipping point is obviously the refresh cycles, right? Because yeah. you put in a sand, you've got 36 months until you need to refresh that, or 34 oh, months right. until you need to refresh that. So, you know, we will be replacing all of our environments with uh, front and center flash uh, as, they ref as they refresh. Our next refresh is August, uh, and, then, and then not until next year. So um, it'll take a couple of years for us to be 100% across all our sites. You know, Bruce, that, that reminds me of a customer I spoke to this morning, Dave, and he said that, look, we have multiple arrays, and now we do a tech refresh every year, because you know every year one or two arrays will come off lease yeah. or will be ready for a refresh, right? So he says we're on a continuous refresh cycle for the next five years, right? And, and every time we do that, we, we're evaluating all flash, and he says, interestingly enough, we did one set of purchases, the next set of purchases are so much lower, because the technologies are going up, uh, prices are coming down, uh, are you a primarily, primarily an HP shop? 
So yeah, we're wall to wall HP on all of our environments, with the exception of some of the networking and firewalling elements. Um, but so, yeah. did you not look at competitive all flash arrays? Or we have. Uh, we've certainly spoken to uh, a number of competitors in the market, and we have actually had in the lab environment some competitors uh, SANS for trial purposes. It's interesting, you know, when you compare that. And uh, having talked to the operations team around the experience, right from getting it out of the box to running it up, it, it, it just never compares with what we've had over the last five years with three par. Yeah, well, three par is the gold standard for yeah. standing up infrastructure. I mean, that's always been the claim to fame there. Um, okay, so I, I don't even have to ask you why HP. You pretty much just answered it. But I, I want to ask you about the stack. Mm -hmm. So one of the advantages that we've always talked about with HP is that you didn't choose to go buy an all flash array startup. Sure. Yeah. You, that didn't have a hardened stack. You're building on top of three par. Now a lot of your competitors at the time would say, "Oh, that's a bolt on." Well, that's kind of what you guys used to say about thin provisioning that was bolted on. So, well, others, right? But, yeah. but you always said we used to have David Scott. He said, "No, no, you don't understand. The architecture is such that, and who knows? You know, when, when the top guy says that, maybe, maybe it's marketing. You don't know until you, you actually see the proof. You know, as a customer, yeah. you know, you just never know." Um, it, it appears that the architecture was no, were able to accommodate that. You know, no question. So, so, how important is that stack? to you as a, a customer, that robust, full set of storage services? It's basically the fund fundamental reason for our success, I would I would argue, uh, if you think about the, the need to put in an environment and a hand on heart know that everything's going to interoperate um, well uh, and cohesively, uh, and that the vendor is going to give you end-to-end -end support across that entire ecosystem uh, and outside that ecosystem in terms of your overall roadmap, that is the, the success of, of my business, is uh, that partnership with HP. Yeah, yeah now, what are, you, what are you hearing in the field in terms of how much of a differentiator that is? Oh, the, that is a huge, huge factor from many customers, right? The fact that it's one version of the same feature set, same operating system across their different infrastructures. Uh, yeah, big, big factor. Uh, the fact that they can buy different size flash arrays, another big factor. Uh, we're also hearing from our customers that they go all flash then after a year, year and a half, they say, look, we may have a use case for spinning. They want to add spinning to it as a tier. They have that option as well, right? And yeah. uh, That happened to us exactly, right? <laughs> so we, we went all flash in one of our facilities, obviously the end of uh, 2014. 100%, uh, the only spinning disk was the backup, store, the backup stores, right? So there was no production uh, spinning disk at all in that environment. And we did that because the price point on, on Flash had gotten to the level where even at one-to-one, -one, so no dedupe, it worked for our business model. We did not have to change our go-to-market pricing at all, so it was a no-brainer. Uh, we got some dedupe, so that's a nice win for us in the overall scalability. But as we got you know, sort of up in the 70, 80% utilization on the sand quicker than we expected, uh, we suddenly thought, well, actually, let's take a look at what's being stored here, and we found there was a huge amount of data at rest. You know, we've got customers with three and four terabyte file servers, and they, they access maybe 10 or 20% of those files in any given month. Mm -hmm. So for us, it was a no-brainer then to then think about spinning disk still has a play right now. Yeah. And so we, we augmented unless the, the environment. Unless the, the CapEx crosses over, then... Right. And we'll whatever. get there, we'll get there. But as you say, yeah. that could be 18 months to two years. So you're, you're using uh, a data reduction, do you do? We are, and right. your flash array. Yeah. And, and, and what are you seeing for Yeah, we're seeing, uh, uh, we're seeing sort of in the 1.5 to 1.8 range, depending on the, uh, on the CPG, depending on the workload. Bear in mind, we're a service provider, so it's very, a very mixed workload. We have no idea what customers are going to do on any given day, right. uh, what they're going to upload or what they're going to change. Um, so we're still, we're still working with that. It's only been sort of nine months on the, on the environment, and there's a lot of tuning that can be done. We've measured the install base, Dave. Uh, we are seeing, on average, two to one yep. across the install base. Uh, and we are seeing cases where, clearly, VDI is one where you get good three to one, four to one, five to one, yeah. uh, sometimes even higher, depending on the workload. Uh, interestingly enough, there is also a lot of zero data that shows up. Uh, that continues to show up, so uh, even in VDI environments, um, but yeah, yeah, and that's part of the two to one. The, the, the oh no, when, in, in cases where on average two to one, yes, but yeah. in cases in VDI where it's higher than two to one, like three or four to one, yeah, that's part of the part of it, right? And I think calling so it out separately from the dedu, right? So you're you're talking about three to four dollars gigabyte raw, and then you're getting that down. You're, cu you're cutting that. Well, at two dollars a gig usable, we were at about six and a half, seven raw. Yeah. Right? Okay. Um, we're bringing that down now. We're at dollar fifty usable, 
right? And uh, we've seen some customers gone up to 10 to 1 yeah, <laughs> on okay. VDI. Yeah. Uh, Do you have tools to help them predict, like you did with thin provisioning? Yes, we actually have tools that let them take a thin provision volume, for example, and run some dedupe analysis and says, okay, how much duplicate data do I have in this volume, right? Mm -hmm. Especially if they're running on a spinning array and moving to flash, mm -hmm. then we can say, okay, here, here's how much, how much of a use case you have a duplicate data and how it can justify your spend. And do and you have a hero report at the back end like you used to? With so the, we still do that, the telemetry data that comes back and we aggregate data. The two to one measure I gave you was aggregate telemetry data. We should let Floyer whack at some of that data. It's all, it's not, you know, it's all metadata, right? It's no yep. customer yeah, we, information. Yeah, we keep all the customer customer specific things out. It's just generalized data. Love to, yeah. to, to take a look at that and see, because you, you're getting there where you have enough data now to start analyzing that. Well, you know, one, one, one thing that's very interesting, uh, Dave, we looked at the size of the blocks, the I.O. blocks, and the amount of data transferred. And, you know, uh, it's interesting that 20% of the I.O.s above 16K generate about 80% of the bytes transferred. <laughs> okay, and so all that d benefit comes in that large bytes transferred, right? So it's actually validated our, our 16K design as the right sweet spot for d in, uh, in the array. All right, we're out of time, but Bruce, I'll give you the last word. Um, sure. Talk about cloud, you know, your business, the future, maybe where Flash fits in, but um, what's, what's ahead for you guys? What's ahead for us, so rolling across Canada. You know, Canada's interesting. Segmentation-wise, it's identical to New Zealand, so we can just do what we're doing well, replicate it in a much bigger market, and uh, you know, scale up and uh, use that growth to keep doing things, innovating and keep doing things better. That's great. Well, thanks for coming into theCUBE and sharing your story. Vish, always a pleasure. Dave, thank you for having us. All right, uh, you're hearing the, all, the transition to the all-flash data center supporting the digital economy. This is theCUBE. We'll be right back after this short break. <laughs>